Welcome now to Culture at Work on the Business Radio Network, presented by Crest Insurance with host Matt Nelson. So welcome everyone to today's episode of Culture at Work in Tucson, proudly presented by Crest Insurance Group, where we learn from and celebrate the local leaders, businesses, and nonprofit organizations who have stood the test of Tucson time. I'm your host, Matt Nelson of Crest Insurance, and I'm joined here at Tucson Business Radio X Studios, or at least virtually, today by my uh, colleague and fellow Army veteran, Brett Rustand, this month to talk about crisis leadership and how that relates to workplace culture. So, Brett is a vice president at Crest Insurance, where he's been advising local Tucson businesses, nonprofits, and tribal entities since about 2011 on commercial insurance and risk management within their operations. Prior to his 12, uh, actually more than 12 years in the insurance industry, Brett served eight years in the United States Army as a UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter pilot and company commander with overseas service in both Iraq and Korea, ultimately attained the rank of captain. He's a graduate of Brigham Young University, a Flynn Brown Civic Leadership Program graduate, husband, father, and fellow Tucsonan. Thank you so much for joining us, Brett. It's truly a pleasure to have you on the show. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. So, you know, as we were planning this episode back in the beginning of the year, uh, we had no idea what our community and its business owners were going to be facing in in just a few short months' time. And the past two months or so have been been pretty unprecedented, and unfortunately, we're seeing some some fairly sobering economic and unemployment statistics coming out nationally. Both both businesses and families in Tucson are staring down some, some pretty daunting challenges, and you know, as we were talking about this and kind of reflecting on your experience as a combat pilot, I wonder if you can think of any parallels in crisis management and troubleshooting that, that people might adapt to today. And maybe as an add-on to that question, how do you apply the lessons you learned in military leadership to what you do now as an insurance professional? Absolutely. Well, we'll tackle the first one first, and that is the, the crisis management, because as you know, uh, leadership in the military really is – uh, hardcore lessons in crisis management. And that's kind of how you operate. That's the environment you're operating in a lot, and that's how you need to operate. And so uh, as you think about those things, and, and then you add on top of that aviation, uh, it's also a constant crisis management with helicopters not really wanting to fly all the time. We're not right. by their nature wanting to fly. Uh, so as, as I th- thought about that, uh, the crisis management essence of it really is uh, being able to, as things speed up, being able to slow them down in your mind and being able to prepare yourself and then when the moment hits uh, that you are able to work through that uh, in a process. Uh, the first step in that process, and I think back to my days of flying helicopters, is continue to fly the plane, is when all these crises hit, it's very easy to become consumed with or fixated on the emergency of the moment, the crisis of the moment. Staring, we used to talk about staring at that glowing button or listening too much to the beeping in your ha- in your ear because uh, there's alarms going off, there's bells going off, there's lights going off when you have things go wrong, and it's very easy to become consumed by that and fixated on that. And so the first step is you got to keep doing what you're doing. You got to continue to fly the plane. And right now, that's whether you're running a business or uh, you know, you're parenting kids or whatever it is. Hey, in spite of all the crisis that's going on, you've got to continue to do what you do and continue to keep things moving forward. And so that's a, a real key piece because the media and the news want to drag us into fixating on everything, what's going on. Every morning you get up checking your Facebook and checking whatever it is to see what's going on. It can consume you. So you have to get back to flying the plane. You have to get back to doing what you're doing. Second piece is one of the huge blessings of a uh, – a Black Hawk helicopter is that there's two pilots. And uh, so there's something called crew coordination. And that's when we're working well together. And it works well together because we're allowed to focus on different things while still being coordinated. And whether that's a marriage, a husband and wife, or that's business partners or whatever it is, it is one person to say, okay, right now I've got to fix, I've got to take care of things inside the cockpit. So I'm inside, you're outside. And you coordinate and you work, so you're focusing on different things, so you continue to be able to move forward. Because if you both decide to pull inside and stare at that glowing button or stare at the crisis of the moment, guess what? No one's flying the plane. No one's taking care of things. So working on that crew coordination is key 
was in business or family. And the last thing that I always learned about for military leadership is uh, John Wayne said it best when he said, uh, you know, courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyways. It's not a matter of not having fears. Uh, it's a matter of being able to recognize those fears, uh, categorize them, and then then push through them. And whether that's a crisis or as business leaders, if we're worried about our business, there are legitimate fears or family members or even as we're parenting kids, they have legitimate fears. And the, these things create fears around us, and we have to recognize them, and then we have to help others and ourselves to then push through those. And so I apply that to the, the the insurance professional side of things as that second question. It really is a matter I took from there, a matter of analyzing risks. In the military, we used to do this thing called composite risk management, where whether you're driving across the country or you're flying somewhere or doing a mission somewhere, you categorize, you look at all the risks you're going to take, you analyze them. You see which ones you can get rid of, eliminate or mitigate, and then you figure out how best to do that. And then you make your decision based upon if you want to do it or not, based upon what your risk factor is. And that's really how we run businesses. Sometimes we don't know we do, uh, but we're doing that same process. We're looking at risk reward. We're looking at what we really need to do and what are the risks in doing it and then putting that in place. And that's really what we do as an insurance is we help people work through that process. We help them eliminate, mitigate, or transfer those risks through insurance. And so they can move forward and take those risks that will offer reward. And that's the really beneficial part or the great part that we get to see on this is helping people through that process. You know, there's there's a couple things as you were talking through that that just jumped out to me. And uh, so first is a funny one, right? So, so one of the things that I always – so I was a crew chief. And so one of the things that I always kind of chuckled about is, you know, when we're mic'd up and, and on the, you know, on the radio with, uh, with pilots, it, every pilot has, uh, you know, kind of that John Wayne tone, right? <laughs> and every pilot's not the same, right? And so, so the thing that, that I always kind of laughed about that is that, uh, you know, it, it's always a very measured cadence um, and it, it's just kind of re reassuring, right? And I was thinking back, um, to it to a really old phrase i didn't realize how old the phrase was until in preparation for today i actually looked it up but it it goes all the way back to pliny so we're talking about 75 77 ad so we're you know about what 1900 plus years removed from it but the phrase is um to pour oil on troubled waters and it's something that pliny actually observed uh, divers doing uh back in you know kind of we're talking babylonian times here i guess and um and so basically these divers would keep oil in their mouth and when they were coming up to surface so that they could see, they would release the oil out of their mouth and it would flow up to the top and it would calm the waves on top. Um, and I didn't realize it, but actually at uh, Cal, they just did uh, a computer model that, that substantiates this. So it was kind of a piece of folk wisdom for millennia and it's, it's something that's now scientifically validated. So, and I think about how tonality and how voice has an impact on that and, and, and the, the phrase is about kind of calming an argument but i think it fits with a chaotic situation like this where you know you're in a helicopter right and for people that don't know what goes into flying a helicopter it's a fairly involved process right it's like it's like trying to ride a bicycle while playing drums at the same time and watching about 15 computer screens right so oh, yeah. so you think about trying to manage all that in a kinetic environment but ultimately also be able to reassure the people that are depending on you and like you said be understood as you're doing crew coordination when you kind of think about how you speak to one another when you're talking pilot to pilot or talking pilot to ground you're talking to maybe troops on the ground that are relying on you is that just something that's just a function of your training as a pilot or is that something that you're consciously doing you're consciously ratcheting yourself down in a situation that is absent that discipline would be spinning you out of control? Yeah, that's a great question because I think that as we talk about crises and emergencies and that things should, as they're speeding up externally, should slow down internally, right? We should take a measured, thoughtful approach as we move through these things, and that's in how we communicate with others as well. 
So yes, you would hope that that is uh, subconscious that you're just you just roll into this you know calm at the moment, but it's not always that way. So there's a lot of training that goes into that too. I had, I had some great uh, instructor pilots and uh, co-pilots. Uh, there's a guy named Big Mike Bahuniak, and uh, he uh, awesome guy. But the thing when things would kind of really hit the fan, as they say, he would he would all come over the radio and just say, "Okay, everybody, take a deep breath." Now let's move through this. Right? Let's work the problem. And you would just kind of – everything would slow down, and in the way you communicate would be very thoughtful, positive, because screaming about the crisis, screaming about the emergency doesn't do anyone any good. It literally just jams up the radios talking about something that everybody already knows is already going on. So you've got to be thoughtful in your communications. Things should slow down. You should take a positive approach of how you're working the problem together and that you're positively communicating. Positive control is where you're, you know, exchanging those controls or exchanging those, you know, uh, requests to do things positively and saying, okay, now you have this, I have this. You take care of this, I'll take care of this, as opposed to just assuming that everybody's going to know what's going on uh, because that frantic moment is what needs to be avoided. The panic, the, fran uh, the, the frantic nature that we all kind of want to fly into in those crisis moments is exactly what needs to be avoided. So then the other thing that, that jumped out as I was thinking about this, and this is probably a bit closer to kind of where my world was on the crew chief side, but, you know, sitting down and before you uh, before you move on something or, or maybe, you know, I mean, in the crisis, I mean, it kind of you're dealing with what presents itself in a lot of ways. but before we would take an action, you know, you'd sit down, you'd do your risk analysis, and you'd have a hard line go, no go standard. And in an optimal world, you've established that ahead of time, right? Like you sat down, you've run through different scenarios on either side of that go, no go decision. Uh, and so you know ahead of time, if this scenario presents itself, this is what side of that decision we're going to be on. And we all agree on it ahead of time. Now, of course, you know, in a kinetic situation where things are evolving, um, that becomes much more difficult, right? Because the, just the, the facts that you're aware of shift rapidly. But so when you think about being in an environment like this, where there's information coming very fast um, and trying to sit down and, and do an on-the-fly on the risk analysis and, and figure out what are your borders, where are my goes, where are my no-goes, you know, when when I think about doing that in the in the cockpit of a helicopter, that seems like about as high pressure an environment as you can create for that. And so, how did you evolve your decision making, your risk analysis process in the moment as you were doing it? Was that kind of like a, you know, you took that as since you were the pilot in command of the helicopter, was it something you guys were working in concert to to talk through it? What was that process like in that environment? Well, it's a good question. So as you as you kind of categorize or triage the emergency, uh, the first thing you run into is the immediate actions that need to be taken, right? So those are often rehearsed ahead of time, and those are encapsulated it, for any pilot will understand that you have your emergency procedures, right? And that's if if X happens, this is what you do. This is you know this is why. This is your response. If this happens, this is your immediate response. This is what needs to happen. And so that's your first initial stage is reacting based upon pre-planned -pre assumptions or understandings so you can then basically start to address that emergency situation. Then you begin the longer-term outlook of, hey, okay, what's the status of the mission? Now that we've addressed this emergency and we're in the process of addressing it, term uh, decisions that need to be made, what's the status of the mission? Can we con continue? Uh, do we need to, you know, do we need to throw a variable in here? Do we need to, an audible, change up the mission in some way? So all those become driven off of the ultimate mission itself, is what, what needs to be accomplished uh, in our businesses, in a military operation, whatever it is. What is the absolute mission we need to accomplish? You've probably done some calculus as far as what you're willing to risk for that. Uh, so ahead of time, so you can quickly do the math, of say, okay, this is within our risk understanding of where we are. No matter how bad the situation is, uh, we are either inside that risk profile or outside that risk profile, at which time we need to address where we go from here. 
if we're outside the risk profile, we need it, we know that the mission is not worth this risk. What our end goal is not worth this risk. If we're inside it, then we can continue on knowing that we've done the calculus already that this is worth the risk still in spite of the emergency or the immediate crisis, uh, it's still worth the risk to accomplish what we need to accomplish for our clients, for our friends, for our family, whatever it is, uh, we can make that judgment call based upon the measures we've taken ahead of time. So you kind of make go through that decision-making process of addressing the immediate concerns, then moving on to the larger strategic concerns. And, uh, and as you make those, you, you do that off a pre-made calculus. You know what you're willing to re at risk for the mission you need to accomplish, and you can stay inside or outside that profile based upon your decision. See, and that seems like such a great skill for, for businesses to have, both in trying to make something positive out of, out of everything that's going right now. I mean, the one thing that seems to come to mind here is perhaps if, if we haven't sat down and kind of created those, you know, those battle drills, right, those, hey, pre-planned, this happens – this is what we've sat down in a, in a semi-sterile semi environment and figured out is likely the best course of action given this scenario. And having those kind of mapped out for your business in advance for the next crisis, right? Because it's not like, it's not like we're going to get through this COVID-19 crisis and the world is never going to go upside down again, right? Um, but then having a decision-making framework to say, all right, if we're outside of, we've established these are our core things that need to happen. This is what it takes to keep the plane up in the air while we troubleshoot. We're running through those scenarios. And in the meantime, that allows us to have the time and energy to, to focus on the things that don't quite fit the scenario that we can sit down and try and with that increased capacity of concentration, be able to kind of focus on. So in my mind, that seems to be one major positive that, that a business could take out of this is to say, okay, we've been stress tested. This is a way for us to be better prepared if this rolls around next time. But before we get too far afoul, because uh, I, I want to make sure that we kind of touch a little bit on how you got into the military. So, so if we back up a bit, uh, you were originally looking to become a pilot when you started at BYU. And you, you majored in international relations. So what sparked your interest in the military, and, and why was that inspiring to you? Well, you're absolutely right. I wasn't. I was headed on to be at law school at Georgetown uh, to study international law. That was what I wanted to do. And uh, a good friend of mine, uh, his name is Ben Shehe, he's still in the military, uh, and he came to me and said, hey, come, come hang out with us. We go have fun. We go compete with other colleges and universities in this uh, kind of sports-like program where you do all this different stuff and uh, military stuff. And uh, so I did it, and I really enjoyed it. The thing that I found in the military, and a lot of folks come at it different angles. Some people want to be in the military from the moment they grow up. Some people wanted to fly helicopters or planes, uh, whatever it is, and that's the best way to do that. Uh, I really enjoyed, and when I first, the moment I first did it, uh, worked with people in the military was the direct interaction. Uh, the most direct form of leadership is, you know, leadership providing purpose, direction, and motivation uh, to people to accomplish a mission. And that's really what it is. And that's in its most direct form, you find that in the military where you're, helping provide that. And then the other thing I found in there, and we can talk about this because it, it's a whole host of things, is the interdependence that you find is that I must be good at my job so that I'm supporting others, and they're good at their jobs because they're supporting me and others. And this woven network or safety net of interdependence is really what drives cohesive organizations, effective organizations, but definitely drives the military is we're really not doing things for ourselves. We're doing those for the people to our left and our right or to our you know, compatriots, to whoever it is, is we're, we're doing those things so that they can be successful. And it's a selfless uh, service that people don't often recognize or associate with the military, is you really are doing things for those around you. And that teamwork, that cohesiveness, and that direct interaction and direct leadership was what really drew me to it. That makes sense. And I mean, the it seems to be one of the things that people so often miss when they come out of the military, right, is, uh, you know, you're, you're used to operating in this environment where, uh, you know, probably initially by, <laughs> by force or necessity, but it, it evolves into, you know, you're part of this kind of family that's moving towards something um, together, but also against 
a fairly austere environment. I mean, that's one of the hallmarks of the military, especially the army, right? Is that, um, you know, you kind of have to band together because if you don't, what's already hard is going to become even harder. And, and that seems to be a bit like trying to catch lightning in a bottle for a lot of organizations, especially, you know, in the United States, we enjoy a fairly privileged existence, right? And so it's difficult to force people to gel together like that. What can you think of as a leader that, that were things that you did when maybe that gelling wasn't happening quite the way you wanted it to within your unit or something like that? Yeah, so you have to you have to get to know each other. Uh, that's one of the biggest things that you realize when you get out of the military is that a lot of organizations function uh, based upon people's self interest as they move forward, but have very little play left and right. Right. So the the people around them, their fellow employees, they're really not tied together in a network where they're pulling for each other. Sometimes even more than themselves, uh, and that's really what the military is about. There's um, a required reading for those officers going into the military, uh, all branches, I think now, but definitely Marine Corps and Army was a book called On Killing by a uh, psychology professor named Grossman. And he talks about through this, uh, what the military has learned over hundreds of years is that you're, when you're tied together in a cohesive group, you're willing to do things for others that you're not even willing to do for yourself. So you would be more likely to do uh, your, your fire, your direct fire is more effective when protecting others. And they've done massive studies going back to Napoleon's time. You are more effective and accurate in your fire when you're protecting others than when you're protecting yourself. And it sounds counterintuitive because most of us think we're self-interest. We protect ourselves. This is what we do. But reality is it's not. And so as you tie organizations together, building a culture – of cohesiveness, building up culture of pulling in the same direction, pulling together uh, is part of getting to know each other, getting to see each other as employees, not just employees, but also friends and family members, and uh, really finding a way to tie that organization together. So we're accomplishing the mission, but we're doing it together. And it's not an individual, oftentimes we see these army or military type movies where it's this one individual who does everything on their own. It really doesn't exist. It just doesn't. Uh, that's a myth. And so what, what does exist is teams of people, everybody filling their role to the best of their ability, working in concert together to accomplish what needs to be done. And that's what you strive for as an organization is to try to create that. So you have to build that cohesiveness. You have to build that team. Now, you can't do it like the military, unfortunately, because they start that basic training where they tear you down as an individual and start building you up as a member of a team. So your entire identity then becomes as a member of some team or unit or squad or platoon, and the role you fill in that, that's your pretty much the foundation of your identity from when they start a basic training. We can't do that without you know tearing you down, and we can't do that in the civilian world. So finding ways to bring people together and realize their essential role in whatever they do in your organization and how everyone else is dependent upon those roles and everyone else doing their job makes the organization successful, not just one individual doing everything. And I think, you know, you really touch on something. So one of the things that, you know, once you have been in the military a while and you look back, a lot of the things that didn't make a lot of sense when you were going through kind of your early training, they just seemed uh, – in an abstract or I guess in a simplified way, you could say, oh, that just seemed like it was cool. You know, it was unnecessary. And and then you you get above the fray a little bit and you can look back and you say, oh, what they were, you know, what I was supposed to learn out of that was this is a situation that was constructed where it was impossible to succeed as an individual. I had to, I had to fail as an individual to recognize that it required teamwork to accomplish this objective. But I think one of the things that really uh, I find interesting because – you know, one of the stigmas in the military um, is it's it's difficult sometimes to get people. You can get, you can certainly get to know the people that you're serving with, um, but one of the real challenges seems to be because of the environment, um, the willingness to get to know somebody down to their vulnerabilities, right? Where they getting them to open up to where, hey, I'm not I'm not able to handle this situation right now, or I'm having trouble with this situation right now. Um, 
Whereas in, you know, a civilian environment, it just seems like people are a bit more comfortable, and, and this is anecdotal, but it seems like people are a bit more comfortable sharing their weaknesses. It's just that the scenarios haven't been created to force them to fail as an individual so that they can learn to succeed as a team. So I guess the question is, how do you get people to feel vulnerable, in your experience, to feel vulnerable enough to admit or to feel, I guess, um, confident enough to admit where they're vulnerable and, and where they need help. Because that is also something that it seems like not only applies to the regular civilian sector in the workplace, kind of, but also, you know, when you look at people in a post-military environment where they're coming back home and, and having to, to be able to admit that maybe they don't have a handle on something so that the team can rally around them and the group can move forward together. Can you speak, up, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, that, that's a tough one because we can learn in failure. We can learn in success. We should be learning in all situations, uh, but you can learn from both of those. But the, the lessons we've got to draw from those, even our success, uh, we've got to draw recognition for those around us that helped made that possible. So that uh, thankfulness, the gratitude, the appreciation for everyone that made that possible because oftentimes in our successes – we want to highlight our individual contributions, right? We want to say, this is, I did this. I, I accomplished this without recognizing all of everything that made that possible and the groundwork that others had laid, the work that others had done to make that possible. Now it's easier in failure to learn in those things because you can see you reached your maximum capacity as an individual and came to your breaking point and then failed. And you realize that you could have used others' help uh, or others could have helped you get past that or beyond that. You might have been successful had you worked as a team. So highlighting those both in success and failure is the necessity of the team it is always coming back to that is that we, we as an individual have very limited capabilities no matter who we are. We could be the greatest superstar we think we are, but we are still limited in our ability and our capacity to do things. That will that is completely removed that cap or that limit is removed when we start to function as part of a team. So the aggregate, the synergy that happens in a team, just like in a military unit, makes things possible that would never be possible as an individual. And we have to highlight those in success, highlight those in failure, and where the breakdown of the team happens, uh, or where the success of the team happened, as opposed to just trying to recognize individuals. Because I think oftentimes, and one thing that I've noticed and lots of veterans notice, is as you get out into the civilian world is that recognition becomes much more individual, right? Is there's there, It becomes much more, hey, this person did this, uh, as opposed to this team or this group or this business did this. And so I think it's important to, to bring those around to, to everybody is we're all part of a team. Whatever business you're in, you have a team, a cohort that you're working with that you need to recognize in success and in failure, you need to recognize that they're a critical piece of this. I agree. And so after you returned from Tucson, so you were overseas in Korea, you were overseas in Iraq, you started, you came back, um, you got involved in both veterans issues and in education issues, um, including, you know, mental health through the Veterans Advisory Committee, uh, Community Partners Incorporated, the former CPSA, Fisher House and Rally Point. So tell us a little bit about your work within those organizations. And do you think that there are lessons that employers could adapt from a community organization like this that maybe if I run, a, you know, a construction company, I might not, those lessons might not be immediately apparent to me um, from the outside looking in, but, but you on the inside looking out and working with both sides at that point, is there anything that you think is knowledge that could be exported and valuable out of it? Absolutely. No, for sure. So I, when I first came back, uh, my family's all here, we had strong support network, everything else kind of started to get back to normal life. And I uh, realized that there was a lot of, a lot of veterans, including a lot of friends of mine that were struggling in making that adjustment, that transition back into civilian life, we're struggling with a lot of issues. I got involved in an organization. I don't think it's around anymore, but it was called Vets for Vets. And one of the things I really quickly realized is because of that teamwork that's ingrained in you and that, that cohesiveness that's your, your fa closest thing to your family as you could ever have, and sometimes closer than your family in the military unit, is veterans, other veterans. And that's how they're built. 
right? So they, they not only engage those that are helping, but those that are receiving help, whether that's counseling or financial help or anything, if it's from another veteran, it's taken with more weight. It's taken with more commitment. Uh, it's received differently and it's given differently. So that, that's where I first came to understand the power of peer counseling. And peer being those on your level or who have shared common experiences like being in the military, right? So you can talk to each other in a way that others aren't going to understand, and you're going to receive communication from that person in a very different way than if it was coming from someone you didn't have that common bond with. So as we began to do things, uh, I began to be involved in organizations like the Fisher House and the building of the Fisher House here on the VA campus. And raising money for that and getting that organized, and that was a wonderful project because it supports those family members to come stay with their wounded soldiers, airmen, sailors who are receiving care at the VA. They can stay in there for free in this beautiful home right there on campus and be near their loved ones. Uh, and then we, I worked with a, a guy named Dan Ranieri here in town who is the head of Law Frontera, outstanding man, and uh, – he and I stepped down and started to kind of just throw out this idea of rally points, which was this place that veterans could rally in time of need outside. In, in the military, a rally point is, hey, if everything falls apart, if we get bro split up, this is where we rally. You know, This is the point where we come together again and reform. And so we put that on paper and started working towards that and created the organization called Rally Point which now provides housing for homeless veterans and counseling services here in Tucson and in Phoenix and uh, has been really successful. And part of the reason we were successful in it is because we realized quickly on that veterans needed other veterans and they need to be able to speak to them. So we started to find those people who had served and helped and put them in a situation or an environment where they could then help those who are struggling. And that teamwork, it's just rebuilding or reinstituting that same cohesiveness that they had in the military, that team, that family that they had. And so as employers hire veterans, we always talk to them about that. Just look at – they're going to need – they're going to look to your organization for more than just you know a nine-to-five ham and a punch out and go home. Okay, They're going to look for some purpose in the organization, and they're going to look for some teamwork or cohesiveness in the organization that – a lot of civilian employees who've never served in the military aren't really going to understand. And so that's an important component as you hire veterans. Uh, again, this is as we've worked with employment of veterans, the thing we've always said from the beginning is that we don't – there's not a single veteran on the face of the earth that I, that I know of that wants to be pitied, right, that wants to say uh, that they're the problem. And so what we've always said is that veterans are the solution to many problems we face, to employment or underemployment, unemployment. These veterans out there are some of the most skilled, uh, independent, free-thinking, ready to get take a job done. I've seen 18, 19, 20-year-old kids accomplish amazing things as part of a team or a squad in the most hostile, austere environments you could imagine. And they've overcome all, overcome all kinds of obstacles to accomplish the goal. And they've done amazing things, way above what we'd consider in giving an 18, 19-year-old, 20-year-old in the civilian world. And then they come out, and they are the perfect solution because they are the best employees you'll ever have. That's just what I've seen. And whether it's local companies here in Tucson or across the state of Arizona or across the nation, what they find immediately is if they can receive those veterans, bring them in, and employ them and then help create that teamwork environment is they will become or are the best employees you will ever have. So they're a solution to a problem of a workforce that we desperately need, and they've already received all kinds of training and experience on how to work uh, in difficult times and through crisis, and they are, they are great at it, and so they're coming to you ready. I agree. I agree. I agree. Well, so quick pause. So for those of you that are just joining us, uh, this is Culture at Work in Tucson, proudly presented by Crest Insurance. Uh, as the largest locally owned and operated insurance brokerage in Southern Arizona and one of the top 100 insurance agencies in the United States, Crest is your hometown broker to assist with commercial insurance, workers' compensation, and employee health insurance plans. I'm your host, Matt Nelson. And now back to our conversation with Brett Rustan, Vice President of Crest Insurance. So... While we're on the topic of um, 
of your well, really our employer. How did you wind up in the insurance industry when you finished your military career? It seems like quite the leap, and I know we've talked about the risk management piece, um, but it does seem like quite the leap from uh, attack airport from uh, from army helicopter pilot, combat pilot uh, into insurance, and then why crash? Yeah, so that's uh, the common expression we get is no one grows up thinking you're going to do insurance, right? So it's it's just not the career that everyone thinks of firsthand because it's kind of one of those hidden industries that's kind of underneath all other industries. It's it, part of it is is the oil that makes the the engine go because uh, it allows us to take risks as employers. Having a plan, and you know, we couldn't build a building, start a company, do anything. Because the first time we have, you know, stumble, the first time we, something goes wrong, we would lose everything. We'd be shut down. Was it not for the security the insurance provides us, the ability to transfer that risk and protect ourselves going forward? So I was in the military, as you mentioned, and we did that composite risk management. So we used to joke that you couldn't cross the street, you couldn't run a range, you couldn't fly a mission convoy through difficult, you know, areas, convoy through Iraq without doing a full analysis of every possible risk you can imagine. And I mean every possible risk. So you would throw on there, I mean, what happens if we get attacked by orangutans? You know, every time, every possible risk that could imaginable would be listed. And then you'd list the probability of that and the severity of that is, okay, what's the probability of being attacked by orangutans in Iraq? Probably very low, right? Very low. But what's the severity if that happens? Eh, medium. You know, if we could imagine that. And so you, then you get, then you categorize those risks based upon probability and severity. You put together these matrix and you analyze what you're willing to allow and not allow based upon the mission you're desiring to accomplish. And you do that every day and in your sleep and without even thinking about it, you're analyzing every possible risk and what you can do to avoid it, to eliminate it, to mitigate it. And, uh, and ultimately to, to transfer it to someone else and uh, or something else. And so when you came into the civilian world, when I came into the civilian world, this was a just kind of this weird idea that you had because business entrepreneurs, business leaders, business owners take risks every day, and they do this similar process without doing it on paper, without you know doing it overtly or out loud, but they're doing it all the time, and they're weighing risk, risk versus reward. And so when I sat down and started to talk to people about this, that risk management fit in the insurance world because we help people analyze risk, whether it's risk to our employees, through employee safety, and how do we cover that through workers' compensation or safety procedures or proper PPE and all that other stuff. How do we protect those employees, the most valuable asset we have? And then also, how do we protect ourselves from all the things, you know, when we have autos on the road and when we have – what are things we can do ahead of insurance – to try and eliminate those risks or better protect ourselves and our assets and our employees. And then if something does happen where we can't avoid everything, we can't totally protect ourselves, there's no 100% guarantee when it does happen, how do we make sure that it doesn't affect what we do and how we can go for it? How do we get back on our feet as fast as possible and get moving with what we're doing? And that really fit in insurance. And as I looked across insurance, uh, there was I had a long-term relationship with – uh, several people here at Crest Insurance, and uh, my father was in insurance briefly in the, I want to say, early 70s, and he was with a couple guys that are still here at Crest Insurance, and uh, so I knew them, and I also knew Cody Ritchie and the team he had built, and I will tell you that coming from a military background, walking in here was kind of like coming home. It literally was a team environment where we celebrate successes and we mourn failures together and we pull together and then his final commitment was is that he was based here in tucson and this is back in 2000 i want to say 11 2010 11 when crest was first had just come back from being owned by the bank and we were small and but we were ready to grow and uh, cody said no matter where we go no matter how much we grow we will always be based in this community and if we do well, we do good. That's how what he always says, drills it in you, drills it into you. And that really spoke to me because that's what I love being from Tucson is I'm committed to this community. 
I'm committed to the community of veterans and I'm committed to the community that is Southern Arizona. And he shares the same commitments. And that is we only do well so that we can help others. And you can see that every day in the sponsorship of organizations and all that we're doing in the community to try to help is he really is committed to this community and Crest is really committed to this community. So I felt that kind of mission and purpose and cohesiveness and team that here that I hadn't felt since the military. Uh, and it really, really is very similar. Although we do very different things and I don't get to fly helicopters anymore uh, it's, and we don't have snazzy uniforms, but <laughs> it's still, it still is a very, it's a great team to be on because it's, it's purpose driven. It's about doing good in our community and, uh, and it's doing it together. I agree a hundred percent. I think that uh, if there's, if there's a nugget to come out of, you know, this type of crisis, it's, it's just on the importance of locality, um, the importance on knowing who you work with, because, I mean, I think that's one of the more illuminating things that comes out of a military environment, right, is, you know, you, you do things for people because you know that they would do them for you. And that's, that's part of that interdependence. And, and it's just difficult to have that when you don't actually know who you're working with. If you're working with somebody, it could be a perfectly good person, but they're halfway across the country and, New York or Chicago, and there's plenty of great people in each of those cities, but it's just, you don't know them the same as you know somebody that's in your community here in Tucson. I, I think that is a tremendously important lesson perhaps to come out of this. Um, so, Absolutely. so in addition to, you know, Brett the soldier, the pilot, uh, the professional, the community advocate, there's, there's Brett the husband and Brett the father. And I'll tell you personally, one of the hardest things that I've been working through right now, and, and I would suspect that most anybody listening here, you know, you could be a CEO of a company, you could be just starting out, um, you know, as a first time manager, but it's, it's trying to explain if you've got, if you're a parent and you've got kids trying to explain, and I'm just trying to explain to my daughter, she's four, why things are the way they are right now. Yeah. Um, and so how do you explain, how do you explain different situations like this to your kids and, and get past the discussion about what's happening to a discussion about what they can make of the situation, because I think it could also be something that's a lesson as a parent that you could easily apply into the workplace if you've got team members or employees that are struggling. No, for sure. I've got five little ones, so the oldest is 13 down to three, and that's a, a topic of conversation that we take very seriously. Because similar to what we were talking about before is uh, you don't want them to become fixated on this. You want to be able to learn the lessons, but you don't want that this to consume them or them to be fixated on this. I don't believe that you want to completely shelter them so this is, they don't know anything about it. You want to have those discussions. You want to recognize that there are uh, there are fears at that even you know whatever age they are is age appropriate obviously but as they get a little bit older. You want to recognize that there are fears associated with this, but you want to figure out ways to work through those. And push through those and continue on with your life, right? So kind of like to fly the plane. Don't get fixated on that glowing button or that beeping alarm. Is you got to continue to move forward and not allow them to be consumed by or fixated by this. So I, I do think it's very important at this time to monitor what the kids are hearing and consuming. I think uh, measured, thoughtful discussions of things that are happening now, uh, helping them to focus on the needs of others. Uh, as part of their own needs, I, I firmly believe in that, is that uh, you can find purpose and understanding of not only yourself, uh, but of, of the situation in service to others. So looking for those opportunities for them to provide service in any way that is, and that might be you know, making something for somebody, reaching out to someone, either phone call or you know, a Zoom call, Skype. Uh, is just finding ways for them to find purpose in serving others in this time, I think is one of the most critical things because they will come away from this understanding that they went through uh, a difficult crisis, but how they frame that, their understanding is important. And if they can frame that in a way, in an opportunity to serve others, in an opportunity to be kind, to help others, then it will help them process that and work through that as they grow. Uh, and then not allowing them to become consumed by it. It's just you can't – we can't impose our adult 
fears, concerns, all that's going around on someone else, especially children, and expect them to process that well. They have to be given it uh, in measured amounts and thoughtful discussions and positive discussions in ways that we can make a positive impact during this time and serve others as opposed to just dwelling on the negativity of it. I agree. I'm actually reminded of, um, and the, the name of the book escapes me, but it was Admiral Stockdale who was, um, he was a prisoner yep. of war in, uh, in Hanoi uh, for eight years. And one of the things in the book that, and I, and I'll, I will track down the title and I'll put it in the, uh, in the comments for, for our interview here, but he talks about kind of the type of people that are able to survive eight years as a POW. And, and among the things he talks about are, you know, having, having a frank understanding of what you're facing is one of the key steps, right? So not deluding yourself, not being overly optimistic and ignoring what's, what's, what you're facing, um, but also having this enduring faith that you're going to make it through it. And one of the ways that he describes uh, the, the, the fellow service members that are that are in this POW camp um, getting a hold of getting their hands around that second piece, that piece of having a convincing belief that that they're going to make it through it was that they had to start finding ways to help one another. And that once they once they were in service to one another, once they identified who was struggling and they all reached down to pick that person up, that the people helping actually became stronger by virtue of the fact that they had a purpose. Um, and that seems to fit hand in glove with what you were talking about, whether that's taking care of you know your kids as a parent, which is which is obvious. Um, but but also when I think about a team at work where you know you've got somebody that's struggling, and and on one hand you know your team can only move as fast as the person who's struggling, so you've got this kind of pragmatic reason to make sure that they're doing okay. But also the fact that when you're as a team bonding together to help one another, that gives every person that's part of that a purpose above and beyond what they're doing day to day to just survive. Um, so with that in mind, and, and I know we're coming towards the bottom of the hour here, so I've got, got one last question for you that maybe we can, can bounce, bounce around a little bit. Can you think of a situation as a leader – uh, where you had doubts about it, and to frame this, so a company commander, how many people were in, were in your company, um, Brett? Usually between 130 and 180. Okay, so 130, 180 people. Um, each of them has their own past experiences, um, issues that they're dealing with at home that whether, you know, they, even though they're a world away from that, it's still something that they're aware of. It's still something that's weighing on them. And so they're looking to you for guidance. And you've got all of this weight on you as a leader, where you're trying to take care of them, you're trying to accomplish a mission. Can you think of a situation where you had doubts about the road ahead and your ability to stay the course? And if you did, how did you find the confidence to maneuver through or around that situation? And really, was there a key lesson that you came away from that with that you bring forward into your life now? Absolutely. Uh, you have to be flexible in your understanding of what coming out of this looks like, right? So I think sometimes we get stuck in the paradigm of which we entered a crisis or entered a difficult situation or an emergency. We get stuck with wanting to force the same paradigm on back end and trying to force things back to how they were. It will not always. Crises and uh, emergencies, trials in life should change us, right? That's what makes us human. That's what makes us better. We should become stronger and better individuals and organizations and companies as we pass through this. So we got to be careful about forcing ourselves into the same box, into the same structure, and seeing everything on the backside as it is and the front side, because that's not how it should be. But a lot of times in the middle of a crisis, we struggle with that because we're thinking, how are we ever going to snap back to how we were? How are we ever going to come back to exactly how things were so nothing has changed? We have to remove that from ourselves, and we have to say, how can we become better, and what does better look like? Right? What does a, what does a more effective organization, a more prepared organization, or a more prepared individual or family – city, what does it look like? 
And so it, we can allow the moment and the trial to beneficially change us in a positive direction. So as we look through the trial, as you start looking through, so different than a, uh, what does mission accomplishment in the military look like? Well, it, it changes based as you go through things. We, we go in saying, this is exactly what I need to do. But guess what? The, no, what is it the saying? No, the greatest plan doesn't survive first contact with the enemy or first punch to the face. If you're Mike Dyson, it's, it's <laughs> that first initial jarring moment things change and you have to allow them to change while still maintaining your commitment to your core principles and your core ideas, but moving forward and, and allowing this to change us and improve us and looking for those opportunities to shape things in a better direction. So as we look through this crisis right now, how are we going to come out better on the backside? Not just, hey, how do we get back to real life? How do we get back to reality and exactly as I had things because they were perfect? Well, they weren't perfect, so how do we become better, and what do we do better? Everything from you know, taking care of each other. Uh, there's been a huge outpouring of, of kindness, of support among all people uh, during this time, and I think we just need to say, how do we keep that? How do we sustain that? Because that's a great thing. How do we keep this commitment to support our local communities and local organizations and push through that and maintain that? And how do we come out better? Because as you start to look for those positive opportunities, how do we – we're going to come through this. And it's the shape in which we come through this. What we look like on the backside is going to determine how we use this opportunity. I agree. Well, you know, as we draw to a close here, I just want to take a second to express some gratitude. Brett, thank you so much for taking – uh, some time out of uh, out of your day. I know how busy certainly uh, certainly we both are, and and I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk about this. Um, to uh, Tucson Business Radio, uh, Tucson Business Radio X Studios. Um, thank you for uh, you know for our, our production team here for working through the technological issues of you know kind of the new normal as we work through this crisis, and and certainly our sponsor Crest Insurance Group. Um, just incredibly grateful for the opportunity to work for such a fine local uh, local organization. And lastly, to all of our listeners, thank you so much. Um, appreciate you taking some time out of your day to share with us. Uh, this is Matt Nelson with uh, Culture at Work in Tucson signing off. Join Matt for another interesting Culture at Work podcast right here on TucsonBusinessRadioX.com.